Hello there. Oh, Billy. Hi, Olivia. How are you? Good. How are you? Not too bad. Can you can you hear us fine? See and hear you perfectly. What about me? I can't see my phone. So you see a little you see a little bar on it, right? Across it. Uh, I see the uh, hold on. Yeah, and for some reason it's scratching. Oh, here, let me see what. It, there we uh, go. There we go. Oh, okay. <laughs> You've got me now. We've got you. We've got you. Uh, yeah. Sh okay. I'm, I'm framed all right, huh? Yeah. Yeah. You're looking good. How are you, Billy? Uh, a few problems, but other than that, yeah. okay. All right, Billy. Well, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm so glad that, that we're able to do this. And, and uh, Billy, first of all, I want to say thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, I, as I've told you, BFAN is one of my absolute favorite film festivals. Um, I've actually already be, been to this event uh, eight times now, so they're, they're very much like family to me. And um, I know that we obviously both wanted to go to Korea this year, um, but since we're doing this remotely, I know that you're Korean fans. Perhaps maybe we can start by having you say hello to your fans in Korea. I'd like to say hello to everyone who uh, watches this interview and this conversation and give them all my very best wishes and my hope that I'll one day be able to visit you all there. It's always a privilege and a pleasure for me to, to speak with you. I, I feel like every time I learn so much about movies, about art, about life, every time we have a conversation. So I'm really looking forward to, to learning more today. And I want to give a little bit of, uh, of background about, you know, our project, Leap of Faith. We, we met um, at the Sidious Film Festival back in 2017. And then a few months later, we started the interview process that, of course, led to, to Leap of Faith, which is um, it's, it's a very special film to me. And um, it has been so wonderful to see how audiences have embraced it and enjoyed hearing you, you know, talking about your process, as, as a filmmaker, but also getting some insight about you as, as a person. And, you know, for, for me, Leap of Faith quickly became more than a film about The Exorcist. It's very much a film about you and a film about, you know, what life is about for you. And so I want to start by sort of throwing your, your very first words in the film back at you. you say, the very first thing you say in the film is everything in life is about the mystery of faith or fate, and The Exorcist is about the mystery of faith. But yet, I think that fate also plays an important role in the narrative of The Exorcist, doesn't it? Yes. I mean, uh, the entire process of William Peter Blatty coming on this subject as a young student at Georgetown University, and uh, which you know, could never have been predicted. And then his uh, 15 years of doing other things until he finally decided he'd like to write a book about the actual case that he read about in the Washington Post newspaper yeah. as an undergraduate at Georgetown. And then the fact that he wrote this book, nobody wanted to publish it. And finally... Phantom Books did, and then nobody <laughs> wanted to make a film of it, except Warner Brothers finally said that they would do it. And then I wasn't the first choice to direct it. They, it was first offered to Stanley Kubrick, and then Arthur Penn and Mike Nichols, and they all turned it down. And then yeah. it, it came to me, and all of this was an accident of fate. Yeah. So you believe in fate, obviously. You're a believer in fate. Well, you have to be. I mean, <laughs> we, we, very often we can't control our fate. We can't control... Many people are able to control faith and to either embrace it or dismiss it. But you can't control your fate. If you get sick... If yeah. something happens to you, good or bad, it it's just a part of destiny that's out there. Yeah. I mean, as I've told you, you know, it's, it's funny because I also feel that there was a little bit of fate in 
the in leap of faith even becoming a, a project itself because I remember seeing you a couple of months before Sidges in uh, Strasbourg and and I know that you you were not talking to people during that time and I and I was resigned that I would never get to talk to you and then and then one it, it turned out that we were at the same restaurant on the port in Sidges and you you invited me to your table and and you know in retrospect it feels very much like like fate as well you know well I knew I of course knew uh, your film about the shower scene in Psycho which I yeah. think is just brilliant it's it's just a wonderful uh, analysis of how one of the great sequences ever filmed was in fact filmed. It's, it's, it's really brilliant. And rather than giving away information, it made you understand better uh, mm -hmm. how it was achieved. And yeah. that's not always important for the audience to understand how, how it's achieved. They just have to enjoy it and, or, or accept it or not accept it. But occasionally, and especially in your films, there's a deeper understanding provided of what goes into these scenes. Yeah. Well, thank you. I, that, that means a lot. Um, well, you know, what, one of the ideas that I think is, is central. Why am I looking at a George Romero T-shirt? <laughs> <laughs> well you know be <laughs> at b fan they just obviously they love horror movies you know okay and I'm sure is a big fan is a big fan of george romero as as i am um um well you know one, one of the the ideas that i think is central to to leap of faith is is what you call grace notes you know this idea that it's the small things in life that we must pay attention to. Now, were you uh, first introduced to this through Citizen Kane, or have Grace Notes always been a part of the way that you approach life? Life is made up of very small moments that we don't always recognize when they occur. But sometimes later, a moment that seemed of no interest at all or of passing interest will come back to you with a revelation of some kind that you did not expect or uh, recognize at first. Mm -hmm. And so I've always felt that. Um, th there's just, we have no, uh, very little control of destiny, very little. Uh, and so I've always felt that, you know, that, yeah, you 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 have to try and simply pursue the things that interest you, the people that you are interested in or care about. I mean, I read Marcel Proust all the time, the right. great French author, and that only came about because I was at one time married to Jeanne Moreau, the great French actress. Yeah, and. One day, she asked me if I ever had read any of Proust. I didn't know who Proust was. And she started to read Proust to me in French and mm. translate it. And it was like a magic wand. She opened the world of Proust to me yeah. in a kind of offhand way. And now I'm totally uh, involved with Proust's work which yeah. has enriched my life. I recently wrote and published a book in France called In the Footsteps of Marcel Proust, mm. which I, I originally wrote as a long article for the New York Times. But uh, I don't know if I had not been married to Jeanne, if she had not offhandedly suggest uh, that she exposed me to Proust, I would have no idea about these incredible, life-changing and rich moments. Are, are you actually rereading the works of uh, Post right these All days? All the time. All, All the, the time. time. All wow. the time. Sometimes now, because I have for so long, I just read a passage or so at a time. Uh, it, it's like uh, listening to a, a piece of music, you know? Mm. 
sometimes you simply want to hear uh, the final movement of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. You don't mm. want to hear everything, but you need to hear one movement, or sometimes it's a portion of a trio or a string quartet, or sometimes, as of recently, I've started to read Edgar Allan Poe again. Oh, wow. Uh, I, it, it just came to me to mm -hmm. read again Poe's short story, A Telltale Heart. Have you ever read that? Not that one, no. Oh, my God. Get, yeah. get a hold of that and read it. Really? It's, it's a stunning piece of, of literature, and it's absolutely horrifying, but not in the sense of a horror film. It's just uh, an incredible uh, story, beautifully written, profoundly uh, rich mm. in the ways of, of, uh, of life and death. A telltale heart. Okay, I'm I'm on it. I you know it's it's funny that we should be talking about Poe because yesterday I just watched the uh, Bela Lugosi version of Murders in the Rue Morgue, um, uh -huh. which was a is a very interesting film version of it. They so. they have never done Poe on film. It's always been uh, a takeoff that's been more or less. Um, uh, a send up of yeah. uh, of Poe's work. It's never been adequately presented. And if you read about Poe's tragic life, mm -hmm. his work becomes even more moving. Mm. Yeah, of course, there's all the uh, Roger Corman, Vincent Price, you know. I, uh, I don't care for that stuff. Yeah. You know, they, they, they seize the superficial aspects of of his work mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. the telltale heart wow is that great i uh, remember first learning about the telltale heart when i was a young man in chicago mm. and they used to have stage shows live shows and then they'd show a movie at the chicago theater and there was once a stage show that consisted of a wonderful uh, quartet of singers uh, uh, called uh, the Four Aces, and they were they were giving a concert, and that was followed by Peter Lorre reciting oh. from memory uh, the Telltale Heart. Oh, wow! In just in just a a close-up, and I don't think any film I've ever seen or any story has moved me as much as Peter Laurie's telling of the Telltale Heart. You don't know if this is, this probably has never been filmed, I'm assuming. No, right? no, they weren't filming anything in those days. This was in a time before television. Right, right. Wow, that's amazing. That's amazing. Well, going back to, you know, to Grace Notes, obviously, I'm, I, without giving away Leap of Faith, uh, I know that, um, you, you know, the, the Kyoto Zen Gardens is something that you're referred to as a, as a Grace Note. But are, are there other moments in life, experiences that you've had, things that you've seen? You know, is there one in particular that jumps out that you would consider um, a Grace Note for you? No, there are just many. Yeah. Uh, there's there so many moments that uh, that pass, and you don't often recognize them when they occur, and uh, and then sometime later they become important to you, and and I think it's without reason, you know, yeah. and and without control. I don't summon these memories or reflections; they just occur. But it's, it's, it seems to me that what it's about fundamentally is this idea of paying attention, right? That if we pay attention in life, even especially to the little things, that's, that's when those moments yeah. happen, correct? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yes, yeah. like the fact that you and I were having lunch or something in the same restaurant 
And yeah. we didn't know that. I didn't know you were there, but yeah. I was happy to meet you because I, I love your films. But and it wasn't that I wasn't talking to people then. I just had such a busy schedule sure. uh, when this was going on and very little time to stop for lunch or dinner. Um, and then I understood that you were in the restaurant. I mean, <laughs> or we yeah. might never have met. Yeah, I know. It's, it's very, it's, you know, I mean, I certainly wasn't planning on making a film about the exorcist, but I'm, uh, you know, it's, it's still surreal to me to think about, you know, growing up as a little boy in Switzerland. And I re, I re, as I've told you the story, you know, my, my mom, you know, growing up told me that she couldn't sleep for a week, she, you know, watching The Exorcist. And I waited a long time until I, I could see it because it, in my mind, it was always this film that I had to wait to, to watch, you know. And, um, and then, of course, when I saw it, I was blown away by it. And I've been obviously a fan of your movies for a long time. So to, to be to find myself in the port of Sidges and to, to have this conversation that leads to, to this film, which went to Venice and Sundance, it's, um, I think I'm still pinching myself about it, I have to say. <laughs> it's very fun. You know, one thing that we, uh, that we agreed upon right away in, in our interview process was that we were not going to talk about special effects. You know, we were going to focus on art, on music, process, nuances, um, and you actually told me one thing that really struck me. Um, you said that if you were to make The Exorcist today, you would tone down the special effects. No, I think what I said, or if I didn't say it, this is what I meant. I might, in fact, tone down the special effects, but that would not be faithful to the novel. All mm. of the special effects in the film are indicated in the novel. And I wasn't making an original work. I was the vessel through which the exorcist passed. William Peter Blatty created and wrote The Exorcist. And the incidents that he has in it um, are what I set out to um, film. Not my own version, but I, I probably would not have made the special effects as graphic as they are. Right. I might have put them more off stage. But would that be a good idea for the public? I don't know. I mm. can't answer that, really. Mm -hmm. uh, so what, what, after I met Father Amort, who was the Vatican exorcist, who, as you know, I did a documentary about Father Amort, which is on yeah. Netflix. It's been yeah. there, I think, over three years. And when I met Father Amort, who had been the Vatican exorcist for 31 years, he let me witness an exorcism. And seeing that and photographing it at this distance, at a very close distance, and seeing what this woman was going through I might have done the special effects scenes more along those lines uh, mm. as, as they are in the documentary that I've made. Um, but I was out to, to, to make the novel, not to make my own version of the novel, but the novel. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, you rejected Blatty's uh, original screenplay. Blatty wanted to change the novel. Blatty never thought any of that stuff could be filmed, you know. He, and he didn't think the Iraq sequence could be filmed. And everyone had told Blatty to cut the sequence in Iraq, except me. I mean, his publisher didn't want that. He didn't understand it. The studio, Warner Brothers, didn't understand the Iraq mm -hmm. sequence or what it meant. But I felt it was the perfect set up for the yeah. film, the way to meet the man who had faced the devil in the past, who was an archaeologist, who was based on the, the famous Jesuit theologian, Teilhard de Chardin. 
Yeah, and we'll we'll circle we'll circle back to the uh, the Iraq sequence. I do have a couple of questions for you about that, but but um, you know, going back to to special effects, do you feel that movies today rely too much on special effects? Would you like to see a little bit less of them? I don't go to the movies today. Yeah, I mean, to me, I I watch a lot of old films. Yeah, you know that I love, and I watch them over and over again, like listening to music. Uh, and, um, so I, I don't, I don't want to see a film <laughs> about a guy flying around in a cape and <laughs> tights and saving the world. I yeah. mean, it's all right to see it once or twice, but that's all they're doing in America. Mm-hmm. The films coming out of America are nothing but superhero movies and, they're so predictable, you know, mm. and I, I go to a film in the, in the same way I go to a concert or go to an art exhibition, which is to be surprised and enlightened, yeah. not just to stare at the screen like opium for the eyes. Yeah, I mean, pretty much all I watch these days is the Criterion channel. That's pretty much all I do. You know, I feel like. There's so much greatness to, to dig into. And of course, there are some great filmmakers today, but there's so much, so much from the past that we can learn. And it's, um, it's a, just, just this never-ending well of great movies, you know? Well, I go to the past for not simply pleasure, but for, you know, regaining touch with a masterpiece. Yeah. I'm not going to get a masterpiece out of the Avengers. <laughs> no, I, I will agree with you on that. Now, are there certain um, certain films? Because I, you know, of course, I I know how much you love Citizen Kane in two thousand one and or Ord, which we'll talk about in a second. But are there certain masterpieces from the past that you've been revisiting lately that you hadn't seen in a long time? Or well, I don't know that they're masterpieces, but I've had. My wife and I have recently been watching the films of Claude Lelouch. Oh, yeah. Who made films in the 1960s in France. They were very popular Mm -hmm. and then kind of fell out of favor. But he made some films that are just wonderful to watch. They're exhilarating. Uh, Last night we watched uh, Le Bonne Année, The Happy Mm -hmm. New Year, which is a wonderful film with an actor that I really uh, love to see, Lino Ventura. Oh, he's great. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, oh. and then we've seen And Now My Love by Lelouch and uh, uh, Live for Life. And yes. these films were very popular in their day. Yeah. But they sort of fallen off. And uh, in the same way that Godard has fallen out of favor completely. Yeah. And yet his works, when they first appeared, were they changed cinema. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And he's still, I think he's still making movies. It's incredible. I mean, he's in his 90s now. They're rather but, obscure. I, I, don't, yeah. I doubt that they even get released. Yeah. Um, so now, uh, uh, going back to The Exorcist, you said you wanted obviously to make The Exorcist in the most straightforward way possible. Uh, are you generally more attracted to straightforward stories with no flashbacks and no red herrings? Generally, but my probably my two favorite films consist of flashbacks. Citizen Kane and All About Eve. And mm. those films are about flashbacks, but no, yeah. for the most part, I think it's cheating the audience, but not in the case, I mean, by withholding information for a later time that should have been given at an earlier time. But uh, as a storytelling device, two of my favorite films that I just named use flashbacks yeah. throughout. It's I interesting. I make a film with flashbacks. I, I wouldn't want to do it. I always feel it's like 
cheating the audience by withholding information from them. Mm -hmm. But yet, yet obviously, you don't feel that in Citizen Kane it's cheating the audience, right? No, that's the style of Citizen Kane. Yeah. A series of impressions by different people who knew this man who recount their memories of him. And the yeah. film uh, shows their memories. And the same of All About Eve, um, which um, uh, is about how various people viewed this young woman who became a successful actress by, you know, gaming people in her life and, and cheating them. And uh, each one of them has a different story about her. And yeah. her story is told through flashbacks. And I think that's a film that works very well. And I love it. I watch yeah. it often. But I, I don't see too many uh, films made in these days that can do that. Yeah, I, w I was going to ask you about that because I, I, I also feel that, um, I don't know, it, it, it's interesting, you know, thinking about films today. And, and again, I don't want to generalize because I think there's some obviously some wonderful, wonderful films and, and filmmakers. But I, I feel like the art of the, you know, the straightforward story well told seems to have been lost a little bit today. Yeah, I don't know if you agree with I me. Agree with that. I would agree. You know, I th I think it's almost like this sense that I think there's a lot of filmmakers who want to keep sort of raising the stakes, right? And and feel that they have to keep complicating the narrative to to be one up on on what's been done before. While in fact, a clean story is always um, is always appreciated. I think by audiences. Well, the the films. The new films that I will try to see recently uh, are films from Asia, you know, from various parts of Asia, where art often consists of one line. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in a painting, one line and a couple of other less significant lines. Elegant simplicity yeah. is what I favor today. Not a scene being shot by seven cameras and where the shot lasts on the screen for five seconds and then they, they feel they have to change the shot. Right. I couldn't do that today. But, but that is how most American films are made. You know, multiple cameras and a constant shifting of point of view. Now, of course, that runs completely contrary to what uh, Hitchcock was doing, right? I mean, he was famously wanted to only use one camera on, you know, so to, to, not, to not have options, essentially, right? Well, Hitchcock was a master filmmaker. He could envision a scene in his mind's eye and photograph it exactly as it became shown in yeah. theaters. Today, most of the American filmmakers that I, I'm familiar with have no idea how they want the film to look ultimately. They'll shoot everything. You know, shoot from here, there, behind, in front, from down on the floor, and just keep changing the angle. And yeah. it's not about storytelling anymore. It's about angle shifting, and I think it's distracting. But it is a style that has influenced many other filmmakers around the world. For sure. Now, speaking of speaking of Hitchcock, in fact, you know, my that when when you very kindly invited me to your table in Sidges. Uh, the very first thing you said to me, you, you said you, you wanted to tell me some stories about Hitch, and you told me about your very first encounter with him. Um, I, I think that's a story that would be fun to, to, for you to tell to uh, people in Korea. Well, uh, when I first went to Hollywood, I was, of course, very young, and I had made documentary films, 
which were noticed by Hollywood producers and studios. And I was invited to come to Hollywood from Chicago, where I started making documentaries. And one of the first assignments I got was to direct the very last Alfred Hitchcock hour. By then, uh, the Hitchcock Hour had been on television for 20 years. It was called something else for 10 years, Alfred Hitchcock Presents. And then it was called the Alfred Hitchcock Hour. And the man who saw one of my documentaries was a man named Norman Lloyd, who was a very prominent actor who worked a lot for Hitchcock and for Orson Welles. And he was the producer of the Hitchcock Hour then. And he had seen a documentary I made. And through him, I directed the first thing I ever did on a soundstage, which was the very last Alfred Hitchcock Hour with John Gavin, and um, who was in Psycho, of course. Yeah, yeah. And later became a good friend of mine. He had to approve me for that assignment. But... uh, he was a, a really good man. And uh, so I was, you had five days to make a Hitchcock hour. <laughs> and um, wow. one day, uh, I think it was on a Thursday, Hitchcock came to the set. And he wasn't showing up on the set in those days, they were just using his name. And he would come in one day a week and read his introductions to all of these stories off a card. And he'd shoot maybe five or six of them at a time. But one day he came in on a Thursday and Norman Lloyd, uh, the producer, brought him over to meet with me. And of course I was stunned to meet this guy because I had never met him, but I had learned so much from his films. And uh, I said, oh, I'm really honored to meet you, Mr. Hitchcock. And he, he looked at me and he said, Mr. Friedkin, usually our directors wear ties. <laughs> and I, I, was, I look pretty much like I do now, without a tie, just a T-shirt and a jacket. Uh And I thought he was kidding me. And I said, well, I guess I must have been in a hurry to come to the set this morning. And I guess I forgot my tie. Before I finished my sentence, he had left. He was out of there. He didn't say goodbye or anything else. Five years went by before I saw him again. And it was at the Directors Guild Awards in Los Angeles. And I had just won the Directors Guild Award for the French Connection. And sitting at a table just below the stage was Hitchcock and his family and his agents. And uh, he was supposed to get the award and make a brief speech, and then go off stage and do interviews with the press. But there were steps leading down from the stage right in front of me to Hitchcock's table. And I went down to Hitchcock's table, and I had a rented tuxedo (laughs) and one of those clip-on bow ties (laughs) clipped on. And I was carrying this enormous gold-plated award from the Directors Guild. And I walked right over to Hitchcock, and I snapped my tie at him. And I said, (laughs) how do you like the tie now, Hitch? And he, of course, had no memory of this incident. And it was five years before. He stared at me, but... I carried that memory with me all those years. And <laughs> I was very glad to return the favor to him. But, <laughs> of course, I, whenever I speak at a university or at a 
a, a film event or a festival, I always tell people they don't need to go to film school. They just need to watch Hitchcock films because the entire language of cinema is embodied in his work. The entire language. Yeah. And all you have to do is look at these films and you will learn how it's done. Now, you can't copy it. You can't do it as well but it will give you much more than a clue of how it's done. Yeah. Yeah, I mean... That no p film professor can do. Now, you're, you're, you're obviously preaching to the choir. <laughs> and, um, well, you know, an another, another um, filmmaker that I know you admire that I would like to talk about is Carl Theodore Dreyer. I know he's been a, a big influence on you. And, and obviously we've talked about, and we talk about In Leap of Faith, you talk about... Ord, which is spelled Ordet, which you told me was uh, your only film influence on The Exorcist. But I'd, I'd yes. like to hear... I'm sorry, go ahead. No, it's shot very simply. It's about literal resurrection. Yeah. And you believe it. It's not some uh, Cecil B. DeMille uh, or some aggrandized uh, version of... Uh, a religious experience, it shows the literal resurrection of a, a woman who is the matriarch of a family by a guy who's considered crazy in the film, the, the older brother, and he disappears from the family for a while, and then he comes back at this woman's funeral, and he raises her from the dead. And it's totally believable because it's done simply. And the director who did it, Carl Theodore Dreyer, believed so much in the possibility of literal resurrection that he filmed it with no tricks whatsoever. And that was a clue to me. That's how to do the exorcist. Just this is about demonic possession. Just show it. Just show what that possession is and what the priests do to try and relieve it. Mm -hmm. And Or I might have done that film much more like the man you mentioned earlier, Roger Corman, you know, <laughs> with a lot of tricks and yeah. scary visual effects there are some visual effects in the film that are disturbing but they are done simply and organically and that's because i had seen dreyer's films now and especially ord but uh i'm very thankful for example that i saw ord before i made the exorcist but I'm not thankful that I saw, I'm also thankful that I did not see Buster Keaton's films before I ever filmed the chase scene. Oh. And I've done several, because if I had seen Buster Keaton's films before I did a chase, I would never have attempted to do it, because they're unmatched. They're mm. unmatchable. I mean, he did all this Incredible, stuff. yeah. Yeah. There's no special effects. Uh, yeah. And he created these ideas. He executed them and he starred in them. And he did miracles with film. Mostly mm -hmm. with his chase scenes that I could never approach. And now, I'd seen all the Keaton films much later after having <laughs> done two chase scenes that are rather highly regarded i think i think buster keaton would have loved uh, the french connection that's my i'm that's not sure he, he was so <laughs> good you know in those days they had no great technical expertise in those yeah. days they everything they showed you they had to do it they couldn't do it with a computer i know uh it's like watching Safety Safety Last, you know, is, is an incredible movie to watch. Oh, yeah. oh my God. 
all his films are just yeah. brilliant. And yeah. when people talk about the effect of the chase in the French Connection or to live and die in L.A. and how good they think they are, they've never seen Buster Keaton chase. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, you know, Going back to Dreyer for a bit, I, 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 I'd like to hear a little bit more about why you, as a, you know, as a filmmaker, why you admire him so much and, and why maybe you feel like young filmmakers today should watch his films. They won't watch his films because of the very thing that he accomplishes that they don't do today, which is elegant simplicity. Mm -hmm. Today, films are about complexity and yeah. computer imagery and each film topping the last one for more computer imagery. And um, I guess that trend began with Star Wars, you know, sure. and most of the films that are made in America, which go out all over the world, are just other versions of Star Wars. Yeah. And that's not yeah. elegant simplicity. You, you, it's, the, the computer is a, a wonderful and useful tool. It can take you inside the Vatican or inside the Taj Mahal. Mm -hmm. It can take you to South Korea or <laughs> North Korea without yeah. you having to be there. Yeah. But, but uh, they're usually you lose the simplicity of a, of a man like Dreyer who made Joan of Arc as well. I know. So completely believable. You think he burned someone at the stake for real. Yeah. Well, one of our, one of our discussions that um, I, I omitted from Leap of Faith was how you directed Linda Blair, because I felt that, you know, this had been extensively covered, obviously, but, but you mentioned to me something that I found fascinating, which was the idea of directing in metaphors and how you learned that technique from the great conductor Carlos Kleiber. Could you please talk a little bit about that? Yes, well, Carlos Kleiber, who is uh, largely regarded by other conductors today and musicians, some of whom I had the pleasure of working with when I directed operas in Munich and Vienna. Some of the musicians had worked for Kleiber as a conductor. And then they exposed me to the videos that have been made about Kleiber. And Kleiber would rarely tell an orchestra how to play. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't say, uh, violins play softer, or uh, trumpets play louder, or any of the various sections. He would, he would tell them a story. He would say, violins, imagine there's a beautiful woman sitting here next to me, and she's elegant, and she's dressed very well, and she's just simply gorgeous and you've loved, you'd love to get her attention. So play as though you're playing for her. Imagine her in your mind's eye, and then play to her. And they play it again in rehearsal, and it was a significant improvement, because he was talking about feeling and emotion, not just the technical act of scraping a string across a violin, Right. Uh, and he, he was a remarkable, there's one point in one of the Kleiber videos where, where he comes out <laughs> in Vienna and he starts to play at the uh, Vienna New Year's Eve concerts. They only play the music of Johann Strauss and the Strauss who wrote these waltzes, which we all consider lesser than Beethoven, lesser than Mozart, lesser than Brahms, and Mo uh, but he makes these uh, Strauss waltzes sound every bit as important. And there's this one video where he comes out 
and he's starting to conduct a Strauss waltz, and there's a railing behind him. He never looks at music. He knows the music by heart. And he stops conducting. He leans back <laughs> against this railing. He leans back and he just listens and smiles. And for a minute or more, and they're playing <laughs> continuously. And he turns around because the stage is very close to the audience in Vienna. And he turns around and he looks at a woman in the audience and he says to her in German, he says, you see, they play better when I don't conduct. <laughs> he had that much humility. Yeah. And but his, if you listen to a recording of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, there's a recording of the fifth and the seventh, one on each side, uh, both together. They're definitive. You've never heard these symphonies played before by anyone. He finds little grace notes and moments that I've never heard any other conductor play. Mm. And he, he, he conducts with such a for forcefulness that it appears as though the music is flowing out of him. So when I saw the videos of Carlos Kleiber, I realized that the best way to be a director was through metaphor, mm. the way he did. I, will, I said to Linda Blair, first of all, you have to be like a psychologist with an actor. You find out what are the things in this actor or actress that makes them sad or happy. Sure. Or frightened. And you then return to those things when you're directing. With Linda Blair, I found out that the thing that made her the saddest, the saddest moment in her life was the death of her grandfather. And whenever I needed her to express an extreme emotion, I would just go sit next to her and talk to her about her grandfather and his death. And then I'd put her into the scene and she would do it and it would be perfect because as you know, I don't like to do a lot of takes. I right. don't believe in a lot of takes. I believe in spontaneity. Yeah. I mean, I'm not directing Shakespeare. If I was directing films of Shakespeare's plays or some other great um classic works, I probably would have to do more than one take. But the films that I make are about people out in the street. Was it different for you directing Pinter? Because obviously you had a relationship. Uh, yeah, it was different. Yeah. Pinter was, there... Pinter was England's Shakespeare uh, in the late 50s and 60s and then 70s. Yeah. Of course, he won the Nobel Pl Prize in Literature. Yeah. After, but I worked with him early on in his career, and that's when I learned more than from anybody about how drama existed. Now, for you know, for for my money, and we haven't really talked about this, but I, you know, some of the most extraordinary performances that I think you've ever captured on film were in Bug for me, and I and I'm, I'm I was curious to ask you, did you also direct? Ashley Judd and Michael Shannon in metaphors, or did you have different techniques to no, direct? I was metaphor. Wow. I was never going to say do it faster or slower. Sure. Uh, and I and th this extended to even I don't say come in here, walk over there, then go over there and sit down. I let them find the scene, and mm. then when it looks like to me like they've found it and they're not hiding from the camera but they're going to be in the picture mm -hmm. then i approve it and i let them do it but and i try to impose as little direction as possible the most important thing a director does is his casting 
once you've chosen the story or the script, casting is the next most important thing. And if you cast it properly, and the thing I look for most in an actor is intelligence. Um, if you've cast it well, you're going to be able to touch certain emotions in the actors that they're familiar with. It's interesting because, you know, I remember reading for the review from Roger Ebert where he said that Bug was the, 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 the first movie that he'd ever seen where he felt worried right, about the, actor. the actor. Right, right. And, and like, how, it, you know, it's interesting that you're talking to me about casting because I don't think that even, I mean, as great as these actors are, like, I don't think we, we had ever seen anything from Ashley Judd or Michael Shannon to that level. How, what gave you the confidence that they were capable of delivering on that level? I met them. Wow, yeah. And, and, and most of the people that I've cast, I'll meet them for, I, almost, I never audition an actor. I'll never say, here, read this and let me hear how it sounds. I, I think that's ridiculous. Mm. When, when I cast Roy Scheider in The French Connection, he walked in the room and sat down and I, it took me about eight seconds or less to realize that he was the right guy for that part. And I told him, he said, do you want me to read something? I said, no, there's nothing to read. It's just a bunch of guys groaning and yelling and screaming. There's no literature here. It's all about behavior and how you look. And if you look the part, and guess what? You do, and so you've got the part. So this goes back in a way to to you as uh, you know being a, a, a an intuitive uh, filmmaker, right? You you work a lot on intuition. Totally. Totally, yeah. yeah. So I want to ask you a couple couple of questions about the Iraq prologue, and then I'm going to give you a few um, questions from the audience. <laughs> uh, the one thing I would say to aspiring filmmakers is to pick up your last point is trust your instinct. Yeah. Find your instinct, locate it and trust it. Yep. I, I couldn't agree more. I, I, I feel, you know, on my end that, that, um, I, I always sort of go with stories that I, I can feel passionate about and they sort of come to me. I've never had to sort of chase a story in a way it's, it's, it becomes like something I just have to do, you know? Mm -hmm. so I understand. Hopefully that keeps going, you know? <laughs> yes. Yes, so. indeed. <laughs> um, so, okay. So talking a little bit about the, uh, the opening se sequence in, in Iraq, which as you know, I'm, I'm fascinated by. And uh, in fact, if you recall, we spent the first day and a half of our series of interviews just talking about that prologue. Um, and then, you know, of course you gave me your, um, you know, your, your diary or rather I found it at the, uh, Margaret Herrick library. And, um, you know, you re you refer to that prologue as a tremendous risk to put into a film or a book. Why did you feel that this was a risk and why did you feel that it was a risk worth taking? Well, all it did was set the mood. It had no real relation to the rest of the story. Mm -hmm. It introduced <laughs> Father Marin, who was the priest who performed the exorcism, it introduced him as an archeologist. Right. And that's all it did. And allowed me to make beautiful images of him uh, in an actual archeological dig that was being conducted by a, a German group in Nineveh which is one of the most historic places in the Western world. And um, I felt that the setting of the mood, the almost the spiritual nature of the work he was doing and his ultimate instinct that he was about to face the demon again mm -hmm. is all that takes place in that scene. It's a hint, and then it's gone for an hour and a half. And by the time he comes back 
to the house where the little girl is possessed, I'm sure people have forgotten who the hell this guy is. And as I told you at the beginning of this discussion, Alexander, his publisher didn't want him to include that. Right. Or Warner Brothers. They didn't want me to film it. And no one wanted me to go to Iraq. I couldn't get insurance. The (laughs) State Department would not allow me to go to Iraq, which, you know, if I were to go and if I had permission to go to North Korea, I would want to go <laughs> because, you know, I'm curious, but I'm sure the State Department would not uh, uh, be behind it. Yeah, I'm sure I would not be able to get permission from the State Department. Right. Um, but my curiosity extends to the, the, uh, the whole world. Sure. Sure. And part of the advantage of being a filmmaker is that you get an opportunity to see so much of the world that you otherwise would not. Absolutely. Well, going back to, you know, going back to Iraq, you know, I, I know that one of the things we talked about a lot and that what that you told me early on, actually, in our interview process is that you had some really wild dreams while you were there. And uh, in fact, we searched for months for your dream book and couldn't find it, which still breaks my heart to this day. But, but do you have any recollections about those dreams or, or whether those dreams had an influence on you while you were working on that sequence in Iraq? Or? I think they did have an influence on me. I don't recall them enough to recount them now. Yeah. It's the only time I ever wrote my dreams. And I filled a yellow pad, a big yellow pad, with these dreams I had every night. And of course, the place where I was, was to us in the West, one of the most historic places in the world, biblical, Nineveh. And uh, there was a magic everywhere. And I love the Iraqi people. I love them. I felt very close to them as a people. And they welcomed myself and a crew. I had a very small British crew. I could only bring in two Americans uh, because, you know, there were hostilities between America and Iraq at that time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the things that made me wonder why there's so many hostilities around the world. I don't understand this. Life is such a gift. And why not do everything while you're alive to preserve life? Absolutely. Then say, the other guy over there is wrong and we're going to take care of it and fix it. Instead of just letting people live and enjoy their lives. And that's one of the things that trip to Iraq made me understand. Mm. The people in Iraq were as warm and friendly and interesting as a group of people I've ever met. Yeah. And I Which think that's true. would be the case in South Korea. I think it's true everywhere. I think most people on this planet are really nice, decent, you know, people. And it's always, there's always a few bad seeds, you know, that, that just uh, make it more difficult for everybody, unfortunately. But Well, there's good yeah. and evil throughout yeah. the entire world. That's probably the theme of all my films. Yeah. There is goodness and there's evil. Yeah. And um, it's not a new idea <laughs> with me, but that's <laughs> what's in all the films I make. Yeah. And the, mystery, the mystery of faith. Yeah. And The Exorcist is, a, you know, we, is a lot about goodness. Is It's a lot about love. I mean, it's, it's, it's really yeah. a film about love. If you think about it. Yes. We never set out to make a horror film. We knew it would be disturbing. We -hmm. knew it would disturb a lot of people to witness what was happening to a child. But when you decide to depict evil, you can't just make evil, well, uh, not a very nice guy. It's got to be evil. (laughs) <laughs> for the goodness to be effective. Yeah. 
Well, you know, we, one thing, of course, we talked a lot about uh, while we were making Leap of Faith was art. And, you know, we talked about an, a number of artists from Magritte to Caravaggio, Monet, Rembrandt, Vermeer, Anser, and, and many others. Are there artists that we didn't discuss that you would consider influential on your work or in a specific, specific film that, that, that you've made? Probably, but I think the ones you've named are the ones that come to mind. Those are the ones. Yeah. I'm sure there are others. What about Especially Turner? Because I, I remember sending oh, you a Turner. Photo from Turner. Turner was amazing. Yeah. yeah. You know, Turner invented Impressionism years before there was such a thing out of France. Turner, who was painting in England, invented yeah. Impressionism. Turner's works are inspiring and magnificent yeah i went to see uh the turner exhibit in in london when when we were actually at bfi london for uh for leap of faith wow. and uh oh my goodness it was um mostly early works but it was rooms and rooms and rooms of turner paintings it was it was really and he did everything he did yeah. completely realistic art and abstract art yeah equally effective his use of color is probably yeah. unsurpassed. And light as well. I mean, light yeah. is incredible in, in his paintings. And that, now when you work with, with your cinematographer and, and you develop a style, because I know, of course, how much you get, you're inspired by art, but do you typically bring up certain artists or paintings as a part of the discussion early in the process? Or yeah. is that something that... At the okay. very beginning, I'll either show the cinematographer books of the artist's work or take him to an exhibition that's going on. If I'm yeah. in New York, I'll take him to the Metropolitan Museum and where there exists many portraits by Rembrandt and uh, about five works by Vermeer, mm -hmm. plus the Impressionists. And I, uh, I speak in terms of these artists to the cinematographer and the light that they used and how they used it. So you use those as a, um, as a template in a way, or, or uh, yeah. for certain scenes or certain shots? Almost everybody who makes a film where the photography, especially the portraiture, the close-ups of the people, are mm. really exceptional, are just emulating Rembrandt's use of light. Right. Right, and we talk right. about that. one side. Yeah, and there's a whole segment on Rembrandt, of course, in Leap of Faith. So yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, the one thing that I find really so so interesting also about you is that beyond classical music, beyond art, beyond opera, um, I know that you're also really into some surprising form forms of popular art. I, I know that we've we've talked about and joked about the room about even Beavis and Butthead, right? So, <laughs> so you, you're also, are you uh, equally attracted to pop, to pop art, to certain kinds of pop art? Sure. You know, I like hot dogs, too. <laughs> you guys know what a hot dog is? You know, uh, I don't just like a, a, a fancy meal, a, a French yeah. meal or a gourmet Italian meal or any other country's yeah. Finest. I love a hot dog sandwich or a hamburger, and that's okay. what Beavis and Butthead are. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> the other example you gave. The room? You know, they're, they're hot dogs, they're fast food. Yeah, yeah. Food is good sometimes. Street food, you street? know? Yeah. yeah, street tacos, all that stuff is good, yeah. Yeah, everywhere. <laughs> There's usually fast food places everywhere, and they they may not be as healthy for you, but they sure are delicious. Well, I, you know, I, I wish we could have gone to Beef End because the, the food there is is amazing. The the food I'll and the bet. soup. Oh, yeah. So good. I'll bet. I'll <laughs> bet. Well, I, I envy you, Thomas, and uh, yeah. I envy the people. I was hoping to come to the festival, but... We're just completely unable to travel. Yeah, yeah. Well, let me now let me now ask you the a few questions. Um, I've selected just a short list of questions from the audience. 
uh, that mm-hmm. have been coming from all over Korea. And so, um, so the first one is from Young Lin Fu, who says mm-hmm. that you, you mentioned the film's lingering feeling of dread, but how did you want people to feel after watching The Exorcist? I wanted them to feel uh, moved and elated. In other words, I wanted them to believe in the possibility that there is a conflict of good and evil in the world and that good often triumphs. Not always, but often. And um, I believe that this is an internal struggle. And I wanted people to become aware of that struggle of good and evil. If there is such a thing as a devil that we find in terms of some of the dictators who have run various countries, if there is such a, if, if Hitler was the devil, then the allies who fought against Hitler were the angels and they triumphed. Now, the next question is from Jin Yoon Kim, who says, looking back on The Exorcist almost 50 years later now, how do you feel about the impact that the film has had on cinema? And this is me inserting myself, although I know you don't think of it as a horror film, on the horror genre. I don't know that it's had much impact on the horror genre because... What we did with The Exorcist was we took the time to build up character and make the audience believe in the characters as normal human beings and mm-hmm. in the world in which they were living at the time. Uh, the, the mother is an actress who's on location in Georgetown and her daughter is with her. And I took a lot of time to set them up as characters before anything that could be considered supernatural takes place. But they don't do that today. They just whack you immediately with the supernatural before you've had a a chance to accept the characters as real people. Yeah. Now, I know that one recent film that you've, um, I think you've been pretty vocally um, impressed uh, with was The Babadook, correct? I liked it very much. Yeah. Yeah, it's a very impressive and I film. Believed in the, I believed in the mother and the son. I believed in their reality. Have yeah. they seen that over there? Yeah, it actually played B-Fan uh, a few years ago, and it's mm-hmm. wonderful film. Wonderful film, yeah. yeah. Really scary, actually. <laughs> so, um, okay. So the next question oh, is yeah. from uh, Sok Young Yang, who asks, how do you manage to keep interest in a project even if it takes several years to get it done? You have to be devoted to it. Uh, you don't think about how long it's going to take. What I think about is, how am I going to achieve what I set out to do? And... Yeah. I have not made many films, and they're not all good by any means, but I've worked as hard as I could on all of them to achieve what I was trying to create. And so every day, no matter how difficult the shooting was, um, I was elated that we got maybe two shots I could use. And so, I mean, I can imagine a a painter or a a painter achieving two strokes, two brush strokes that give him some kind of pleasure or a, a composer getting pleasure from two or three notes at the end of a passage the right notes. And so it's a constant uh, investigation by a filmmaker to come up with the best way to achieve what you set out to do. And so I never felt bored or uninterested or 
like it wasn't important as something else. Every day is an adventure when you're a filmmaker, or it is to me. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, from Anna Pazderski, um, she asks, what is your secret to keep suspense and energy in your films? I think energy is very important. And I'm always talking to the actors and the crew about energy because that's what you're drawing from. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's why they say that filmmaking is a young person's game. It's much easier to draw from a well of energy than, you know, come to the set and be tired and try to work up to it. Um, so I draw from energy. The way to hold suspense was identified by Hitchcock better than I could. And that is you let the audience in on the secret. What Hitchcock's secret of suspense was, you know it very well, was if, if two people are sitting at a table having a conversation and there's a bomb under the table that the audience is not aware of, but suddenly this bomb goes off and blows up the two people, that's not suspenseful. It's shocking. There's a certain shock that occurred. But suspense is when the audience knows there's a bomb under the table mm -hmm. that could go off, and then it does. But, and you can hold an audience with that thought for a very long time. Yeah. And, and in fact, you know, in Psycho, and what, what I think is so remarkable about the shower scene is that he does a little bit of both. Uh, there's there's the, the suspense when the door opens, right? When we see, oh. when we see Mother, but it's, it's also, but it's also shock and it's also surprise. It's, it's sort of everything. There's so much going on in that scene. It's, it's really incredible. <laughs> well, the audience knows there's possibly a killer there, but they don't know who it is. Right. And they don't know its mother. And then later they do. But most of the audience is unaware of the psychological right. impact of the guy becoming his own mother and killing through her. I think it's one of the greatest films ever made. Oh, absolutely. By far. Absolutely. And it's so simple. It's yeah. what I was talking about earlier. One or two little brushstrokes that say everything. That's... I think it's Hitchcock's simplest film and mm -hmm. most effective. Yeah, I'm, I'm I still actually... watch it. I still watch it and I take great pleasure in it because it's so well made. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if I've told you, but I've been uh, mulling another uh, very different kind of film about the shower scene. But I, I feel really? that there's a lot more, yeah, there's a lot more that I want to do around that. But not just really? yet. Yeah, yeah. I think you've done everything that can be done. Oh, I don't think so, but <laughs> we'll get there, you know, not, not just yet. Okay, uh, getting to the last three questions here. I've got one from Yohei Okada, who asks, how did your background in documentary filmmaking influence the way that you directed The Exorcist? Um, from documentary, I got the idea that you have to encourage spontaneity. Mm -hmm. For a documentary, like when you interviewed me for your documentary, you wanted me not to read from a script, but right. to be spontaneous. And that's what I want from actors. So I don't make actors hit a mark. I don't make them walk to a mark on the floor uh, I don't rehearse them uh, so that the performance is tired. I, I believe in encouraging spontaneity. And that's what I got from documentary. If you're doing a documentary, like we're doing this Q&A now, mm -hmm. and the questions from some of the audience, um, I don't know what I'm going to say. 
I don't know the next word out of my mouth, but I know that I'm in the mood to express the truth and to do it spontaneously. I'm not reading from a text. I don't have a textbook that indicates the answers to any of these things. I'm, I'm speaking from my own, my feelings. And that's what I encourage the actors to do. Once they've read the script and they know who they're playing and they know the nature of their character in relation to the other characters, then I want spontaneity. Yeah. And that comes from having made documentaries. If you're talking to somebody, you know, and you ask them a question, you don't want to say, uh, I don't, I'm not sure, I, I don't know. You encourage their energy and spontaneity. Yeah, that's what I, I, I think, tried to do with all my films. I think it's wonderful. By the way, what you were talking about earlier—this, the fact that you'd never audition actors—you no. know, in a way, you sort of tap into their 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 energy, right? I mean, that's that's what that's what it's about. You you get a sense of of their energy and what they're capable of. Well, their intelligence and their intelligence, it's right? The yeah, most important thing about an actor, and yeah. that's his or her intelligence. Do yeah. I think that they really understand this role and their place in it? Right. If I don't, I can sense that in one meeting. Yeah. Okay, the next question is from Minami Goto, uh, who asks, at what point in the making of a film does sound design become important to you? It's... It, Every bit as important as visual, and I work on them separately. I do the soundtracks, including the dialogue, mm -hmm. completely separate from the making of the film. Because I grew up when we had dramatic radio in America, and you had incredible stories, especially suspense stories, mm -hmm. on the radio where you had to envision what was happening. You didn't see it on a screen. There was no screen. It was simply sound. But the use of sound effects... I mean, if you listen, for example, to the opening of The Exorcist, mm -hmm. the quiet music, much of which is made by a hand rubbing the top of a wine glass... And then it segues into the music of Krzysztof Penderecki, the yeah. great composer who died recently. But that sound, that music, which is as important as what you're watching, was as important to me as what you were watching. So I yeah. go out and create the track completely. So on the French Connection, after I shot the chase scenes, I went back myself with a tape recorder, a Nagra tape recorder, and I recorded all the sounds of the car, the train, the various oh. sounds they made, braking, and turning, and stopping, and all of that. It was all put in later and treated as it was like a separate art form. Yeah, you, you talked to me about it, and I remember this line because I, it really struck me. It's actually, it's in Leap of Faith. When you talk about The Exorcist as a, um, it's like a sound museum, right? Yeah. Yeah. We, we <coughs> made up a lot of the sounds of the demon voice, for example, from various things. There's a, mixed in her voice, there are pigs in a cage squealing yeah. there are dogs barking slowed down so that they have a different timber there are many different sounds hidden in the exorcist soundtrack yeah all right well final question from um angelina bark and i know we touched upon that a little bit but uh, i think her question is actually slightly different she asks, what is the meaning of the opening sequence?
there's no separate meaning. It's just different in where it's set. It's mm-hmm. different in, in terms of what takes place from the whole, from the whole rest of the picture. But what it is, is a kind of a mythical setting for the whole story. It's showing that there is in northern Iraq a place where demons are worshipped and where there is a man who happens to be a priest who's an exorcist is also an archaeologist who is working on digging for things around this place. And it's merely there to set the mood. It does not further the story, although images from it appear later in the film. During Father Karras' dream, you see the dogs barking in Iraq that happened to Father Marin. You see the stopped clock. You see the St. Christopher medal floating through the air that he found in a, in a hole at the base of a mountain. You see, and the idea that occurred to me, I think it's the best idea I've ever had in making a film, was that things can happen to somebody in another time and another place that later turn up in somebody else's dream or in their world. Right. That's something that I believe. And so I I set out to kind of establish that belief in the opening of The Exorcist. Some of the images in that opening from a desert city and a, a, an archaeological dig from centuries ago turn up in the dreams of a young priest in today's world. And that's something I don't think a lot of people think about. I mean, they they recognize those images, but they're not sure why they're there. Mm -hmm. And that's why they're there, to illustrate that instinct I had. That something that may have happened to you or Thomas or anybody else can turn up in my dream or someone who we will one day come together with. It's It's interesting. It's a force of humanity that unites us all. And it says there is no real time barrier as we understand it. It's interesting. It reminds me actually of, of another thing that I read in your in your diary, and you were talking about the opening as the fact that it prepares the audience for a mystical experience. Is that, is, do you still believe in that? Or uh... Well, I thought I had said that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yes, of course, I think that's obvious. This yeah. film is opening uh, in another time and another place in something that doesn't appear to have anything whatever to do. Mm. with the demonic possession of a 12-year-old girl in Georgetown. Yeah. Well, Billy, I think, um, I think this, uh, this is the conclusion of our uh, wonderful conversation here. I, I'm you know, really, really grateful for, for your time, as I'm sure um, Thomas and everybody at uh, BFN is. And, well, I'm uh, very happy to uh, at least be a part of BFAN in this way and happy to answer your questions happy to meet the two of you and i hope one day to visit south korea it would give me great pleasure to come i was hoping to come this year as you know thank My you so pleasure. much it was wonderful as always and god bless alexander god, god bless you. you all right talk soon bye bye